Good morning. My name is Sarah Scott, and I will be reading Romans 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Would you pray with me as we begin? Our God and Father, we count it a joy once again to be together as your people, to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, clinging to Jesus Christ in faith for hope, for our salvation but also gravitating toward the truths of your word. And we count them to be absolute truth, for they are your words. They reflect you know, an overflow of your heart, your mind, your love for us, your plan, your purpose for our lives and for your glory. And so, God, this morning, what you have planned before the foundations of the world to accomplish with the preaching of your word and with the gathering together of your people, we just ask that you would bring that about. Give every one of us humble hearts, ready to receive the truth. Fill our hearts with joy and strength and boldness to walk in obedience to that truth. Father, if any of us, the preaching, to the singing of your truth, the reading and the preaching of your word, if, God, if there are areas in our lives that need confession and repentance, bring them to our attention. Let us be quick to repent. God, if there are areas in our lives that you make aware to us that perhaps need to be renewed in terms of a commitment, make us aware and give us the strength to renew ourselves and our commitment towards you. Father, our days here on this earth are soon to be done, and they do not compare to the ages upon ages of eternity in your presence. Give us a glimpse of that. Give us a hunger and a thirst for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke tells us and records for us an account of Jesus spending time in a Pharisee's home for dinner. Luke chapter 7. And uh, while Jesus is reclining at table there, enjoying a meal in the company, uh, as they are eating, there is a woman who had a poor reputation, probably, in that area. She was known as a sinner. And Jesus, as he's eating and reclining at table with them, this woman comes up from behind. She brings an alabaster flask of ointment. And Luke tells us that she says he's, she is standing behind him at his feet, weeping. And she began to wet his feet with her tears, wiping them with her hair, kissing his feet, and anointing them with the ointment. Luke tells us that in his head, that Pharisee, his name was Simon, was thinking to himself, he's, if, if this man was truly a prophet, he would know who this woman was. Jesus, of course, knowing what Simon the Pharisee was thinking, begins to give a, a short parable, a small story to prove a point and a truth for him. 
So Simon, there, were, there, there was this money lender, and he had two men that he had lent money to. One of these men, he gave 50 denarii, or two months' wages, and another man, he gave 500 denarii. And that would have been about two years' wages. Well, this money lender goes to both of those men, and he forgives them their debt. And he asks Simon just a simple question. Who loved that money lender more? The one who was forgiven little or the one who was forgiven much? Simon answers correctly, I'm sure as all of us in here would. Well, of course, it's the one who is forgiven much. And as he looks at this woman, he begins to speak to Simon and says, Simon, I entered your house. You didn't wash my feet. You offered me no water, no ointment, no oil for my head. You didn't offer me a kiss and welcoming. Yet all this woman has done this whole time is all of this. Because her sins are forgiven. She has been forgiven much. And Jesus says, those who are forgiven much love much. Paul, as he is writing this letter to the Romans, is reminding them, you have been forgiven much. My hope and desire as we study through this book, and it's been a prolonged study, and we're going to prolong it even more, is that we would come to the realization that we have been forgiven much. That we would echo with the Apostle Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, all throughout our study at this point, Paul has written beautiful passages that describe the gospel. I've read just one of you, one of them already. First John excuse me, Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. If you're there in Romans 8, turn back to Romans 3. Romans 3, in verses 21 through 24, Paul would write, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He would continue on and also in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He continued on in chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans chapter 6, 22 and 23. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We come to another one of these great passages, these great gospel statement here in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have in your notes that our passage this morning, as it was read, is verses 1 through 11. Well, as I was preparing and studying this week, I couldn't get past verse 1. So this morning, we're just going to allow our hearts and minds just to soak and dwell a little bit in the beautiful truth and the reality that Paul writes in Romans 1. But I do want to neglect the reality that we do have our children in here with us. And I hope that they brought your journals for our children, their own personal journal, because as you get back into Grace Kids uh, next month, I believe you're still able to accumulate points for having these notes filled in. So I want you to be able to have these, be able to think about them, talk about them with your parents. But our passage this morning, and uh, you're going to get it right in your notes, your parents and their notes get it wrong because they have 1 through 11, but you can write down Romans 8, 1. And, and who is it in our passage this morning that we're going to be talking about? It's not everybody in the world. I hope it's everybody in this room. But it's every person who is in Christ. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit again. I've, this idea is not new to us, but every person who is in Christ. And our big idea for this passage is the very first verse. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is our big idea. I want to also take a few minutes, and if you would just bear with me, and I've tried to do this as often as I can. It's very easy, as I've said in the past with the book of Romans, to kind of get lost in the forest of Romans. And I, I don't want to do that. I, I want us to be able to zero in on a single tree this morning, but I don't want us to get lost. And so just let me provide a little bit of context to where we are. We have, we're coming to the end of this major section in Paul's letter as he's writing that chapter 5 to chapter 8 that we've titled, This is the Reign of Grace. And in chapter 5, Paul introduces, and coming off of this righteousness that is lacking in us, chapters 1 through 3, there in chapter 3, God made this righteousness available. Chapter 3 and 4, that righteousness can be ours when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. It is through faith. Abraham is that example. And then in chapter 5, he begins to give us what is his favorite designation for what it means to be a Christian. And that is being in Jesus Christ. And so in chapter 5, the justified person is in Christ. And then in chapter 6, all that is Christ's is ours. His death, his life, his burial, his resurrection, his position is our position. His new life is our new life. And so in chapter 6, because of those realities, we are dead to sin and alive unto God. And that is, the, that is the attitude, the mentality, the way we need to be thinking about ourselves and the way that we need to be presenting our lives, our bodies as instruments of that righteousness. And in chapter 7, we're reminded that we've been freed from sin and sin's dominion and reign in chapter 6. He continues on and says, and we've even been freed from the law. But even though we've been freed from the law, this we have been awakened to another law in us, and that is the law of our sin. And that we, we have this war that is waging within us. And in chapter 6 or 7, we're told, we, we, just, we need to take ownership of this battle. That my real problem is not outside of me, but inside of me, and that is the law of my sin. Who will deliver me from this? And we step into chapter 8, and Paul begins to answer that our hope for victory is not my own strength and ability. My hope in defeating the law of sin is the Holy Spirit. 
And as we begin to work through chapter 8, we will see that through the Holy Spirit, it is only through the Holy Spirit because He is our hope for a life of righteousness. These first 11 verses, Jesus, the Holy Spirit is our hope for a life of righteousness, walking in the Spirit. Verses 12 to 17, we're going to see that the Holy Spirit is our voice of assurance. And in those special verses in 18 to 30, we will see that the Holy Spirit is our help in weakness. And then he closes out the chapter with that closing bookend that speaks of the security that we have as justified people. He opened this section at the beginning of chapter 5, and he closes this reign of grace section with the beautiful verses at the end of 8. But as we begin to work our way through this first 11 verses, and just one today, but these first 11 verses, I want you at least to notice the flow of Paul's thought. And if you like to write in your notes, I just want you to notice in verse 1, he makes an assertion. He states a fact. And that fact is our big idea that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then the beginning of verse 2, he starts with the word for. Well, well what's the basis, Paul, for that statement? Well, that basis, the basis for that assertion in verse 2 is that the law of the Holy Spirit has freed you from the law of sin. Well, well how does that happen, verse 3? What is, what is the means of that? Well, God has done what the law couldn't do. He condemned a sin in the flesh. And then in verse 4, gives us the purpose. You see verse 4 starts with, in order that. We have this assertion, the basis for this statement of reality, the means of that reality and that assertion, and now, well, what's the purpose of it? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Think of the significance of that. Even the gospel is not veering away from the righteous requirement that God has. We are given the Holy Spirit so that that righteous requirement will be filled in us. And then from chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 5 down to verse 11, he provides the assurance that that will happen. The assurance that that righteous requirement will be attained and fulfilled. And it's done through the Spirit of God dwelling in us. In fact, he states it as a fact in verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact, and he does, the Spirit of God dwells in you. But we just direct our attention this morning to verse 1. The assertion. What is the statement of reality and truth and fact that God's people need to cling on to and hold on to? That there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And as we meditate, dwell on that, I just want us to notice three things. First of all, I want us to notice the joy of of God's posture toward his people in that statement and in that truth. I wanted you to think of that statement in terms of posture. You know, body language speaks. Our pets learned this. Our loved ones learned this. Our children learned this. There is a posture that God has toward his people. And I want us to think not just of this posture, but the activity that flows from such a posture. But it's a posture of no condemnation. What is condemnation? What does this mean? Well, to begin, this word here, used in this way, it, it's only used three times in the New Testament. It's oftentimes used in a, in a verbal form, but not in a noun form. It's used twice in chapter 5, but then also here in verse 1 of chapter 8. 
And when it's used in its noun form, there is no condemnation. It doesn't just mean giving the sentence. We think when we condemn someone, we, we've just told them, this is your sentence, your, um, the pronouncement or the determination. You're guilty. But in the noun form, it's not just, this is the sentence that I pronounce upon you, but it's also the execution of the punishment. It's both. And I think this is important for us. Because I think sometimes for us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we are, we are very quick and we gravitate toward claiming the pronouncement. Not guilty. But we are very slow and oftentimes questioning and doubting the treatment. We question the treatment. And we look at our lives and our relationships and say, I know my position before God, but I doubt his activity that is flowing from that posture. But a posture of God of no condemnation is both the sentence and the treatment. God's posture toward his people is not a condemning posture. It's not a, a retributive posture. It's not a judging posture. In one word, it is a favorable posture. Let me explain or illustrate it this way. Think of the parable that Jesus spoke about the prodigal son. How the prodigal son rebelled and rejected his family, his father. And he left and he wasted all that his father had given him. And coming to his senses, he goes, I'm going to go back to my dad, but I'm going to go back as a servant. And he makes his way back. And what is his father's posture toward him? He sees him in a distance. And he runs toward him. He embraces him. He kisses him. He welcomes him. He celebrates him. And the father's reception of his son is, I am not your master. You will call me father. That is the posture of favor. That is the posture of no condemnation. That is the posture that God has towards his people. Think for us, perhaps also, to illustrate two times when God the Father spoke audibly about his son Jesus during his incarnation in his ministry, at the baptism and at the transfiguration. And in both times, the voice from heaven of God the Father is saying, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. Favor. And here is Paul telling us that to be a Christian, to be a saved person, a justified person, one who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, the best description is someone who is in Christ Jesus. And if we are in Christ Jesus, God the Father looks at Jesus and says, my son with whom I am well pleased. And that reception is also the same for all those that are in Jesus. For they have the same reception from the Father. Consider, for example, how this book started, how Paul's letter began. It began singing the praises of the gospel, that he's not ashamed of it because it's the power of God for salvation, because the righteousness of God is revealed in it. And then the third reason he's not ashamed is because the 
the wrath of God is being poured out. And it is being poured out on people who are rejecting him. People who are suppressing the truth. And the posture that God has towards those that reject him in chapter 1 is he is against them. He is opposed to them. And we see in chapter 1 not just the posture, but also the activity that flows out of that posture because God the Father, those that reject him, his posture is against them, his posture is wrath, his posture is judgment, and the activity is, I give you over to increasing sin as your payment, as your punishment. I give you over toward the deserved detriment of your soul. That is the posture of God toward those that are not in Jesus Christ. That is a condemnation posture. But for those who are in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. It is not an opposition and a rejection and wrath. Rather, it is favor. And the, the activity that flows out of a posture of favor for God, for his people, is one of goodness. That's why we will make our way to verse 28. That God, for those who are in Christ, his posture of favor is working all things for good. And I guess I would summarize this activity flowing from this posture of no condemnation as one of secured favor. And God expressing his favor primarily through the refining and transforming work of sanctification the work of Christ-likeness in every one of his people. The outworking of that righteousness, the, the practical production of righteousness in our actions and in our lives, for that is that path toward eternity. And that is our good. It's the posture, the joy of God's posture toward those who are in Jesus Christ is that of no condemnation. But it is also the joy of God's reason for this posture. He started verse 8 with, there is therefore. Therefore. And as we've learned over and over and over, when you see a therefore, you must see why it is therefore. Right? It's a conjunction, and that conjunction is always connecting what proceeds from it, what, what follows it with what has preceded it. And what has what just preceded this, this assertion, this designation that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? What has Paul just got done talking about? He has just got done talking about all that thrills our soul, right? The war within us. He just got done talking about that my sin is my problem. And that the law of sin is operating and exerting its influence at every point in my life, especially when I'm aiming to do what's right. That this law of sin is, is at war with me, especially when I'm trying to reckon myself as dead to sin and alive to God. Especially when I'm trying to present my body as an instrument of righteousness, so much so that I continue to do the things that I don't want to do and I continue to fail to do the things that I want to do. And Paul's like, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me? Therefore, I'm a wretched man. Therefore, how would you finish that? How do we often finish that? We're all keenly aware of that war that's raging inside of us that daily battle, that struggle, and how often we give in and fail. 
Paul's conclusion. Therefore, I'm not condemned. Just doesn't seem like that would fit. Like, like why is this the conclusion from chapter 7? It's because... Performance doesn't inform the position. Paul's performance in Romans 7 is not informing his position. Rather, his position determines God's posture. His performance doesn't determine God's posture before him. It's his position. It's his position in Jesus Christ that informs God's posture. It's this position in Jesus Christ that has awakened the law of sin within him and has driven him to depend totally on God's provision to win the battle. Remember, chapter 7 is not experienced by those who are outside of Christ, only those who are in Christ. You know, too often we allow our performance to shape our view on our position with God. But it is our position with God before Him, being in Christ Jesus, that shapes His posture. And it is our position which motivates and drives then and informs our performance. It's why all through Paul's letters, Paul will be, he will continually say, remember who you are. Remember the truth, the truths of the gospel, and let those truths inform your performance. And he's doing the same thing here. And it is worth noting that this position that informs God's posture, not everybody is in this position. Paul qualifies this posture of no condemnation And it is only for those who are in Christ Jesus. So those that are outside of Christ, what is God's posture toward them? It is not one of no condemnation. It is one of condemnation and of wrath and justice. So how does one go from being outside of Jesus Christ to being in Jesus Christ to that Position of secured favor in God's posture of no condemnation, well, it is only faith in Christ. It is a repentance and a confession of your sin and your need for Christ, and it is a faith and trust in who He is and what He has accomplished as your substitute on the cross, paying your penalty of sin. And so we celebrate the Lord's table this morning for very good reason. For we are reminded of our position in Christ. And I would hope that for those either here in this room or listening at a future time, hearing about God's posture, that if you are not in Christ Jesus, that hearing about God's posture toward those in Christ Jesus, it would be a sweet and effective call to put your faith in Christ Jesus. Do not let another day go without doing so. Because that will be another day with the posture of God towards you as one of condemnation. But there's one more joy I want us to catch in this. It is the joy of God's posture towards his people. It is the joy of God's reason for this posture for those that are in Christ Jesus. And it is the joy of God's posture for his people today. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation. In some way, this idea of now, perhaps, is a logical flow after everything, everything that he's written through chapters 1 through 7. Well, now, there's no condemnation. But he has the therefore there. And I think that's what he's using therefore. And I, want his, I think he wants his readers to recognize, well, therefore, now, 
now, today, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We often maybe find ourselves gravitating, well, no condemnation, that's for eternity. But it is for today. This posture is more than a posture that God's people will enjoy for endless ages. It is the posture of God's future presence, but it is the posture of his people for today. And we must cling to that and appropriate that and to recognize and to claim in a way that today in every area of my life there's no condemnation there's no condemnation in everything your physical pain and your worsening suffering is in the context of no condemnation Your broken relationships, the hurts and the wrongs. It's so easy for us to look at our pain and to look at broken relationships, and we, we, we know the position, but we doubt the activity from it. God must be punishing me. Well, even in our broken relationships, I am not under God's condemnation. Maybe you look at your not just your relationships, but maybe your failed responsibilities and personal sins in those relationships. Even in those, no condemnation. You see, in all of those scenarios, today, God's posture and the activity from such a posture is not one of condemnation. It is not one of wrath. Why? Because all of God's wrath for those in Jesus Christ was absorbed in Jesus Christ. And in all of those scenarios today, God's posture and activity is one of secured favor today. In working out your good today. Romans 8.1 is the answer for all of those. He refines us. God disciplines his own. But he does not condemn his own. And so with all of this, we come to the Lord's table this morning. And I want us to, as we partake of the Lord's table, just to consider our take-home truth as well as our takeaway task. This truth that God's gospel posture toward his people is one of no condemnation. And our task is to embrace my no condemnation position before God every single day. And as we celebrate and remember our Lord, Je our Lord Savior Jesus Christ, if, if you know Jesus as your Savior and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you are in Christ Jesus, I invite you to participate this morning, to join us. And we will hand out the elements, and as you are either waiting for it or you've gathered your own, take a few minutes, ponder and review in your own heart and mind and soul, where am I? Have I lived faithfully? Have I embraced this no condemnation posture and position from God? Do I see his goodness and his good work in all areas of my life? And just realign your own heart and soul with that of God's. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, as you allow the elements to pass by as our men will be handing them out, I beg of you to please consider today, let today be the day where you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And to consider these truths and the realities that by not putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you stand before your Creator is condemned. And every moment here on this earth is an act of mercy to plead and to call you to put your faith in Christ. So I'm going to ask our men to gather together as we prepare to hand out our elements. Please hold them, and then we will partake together after all are handed out.
we have together in our hands nothing mystical or sacred other than what it represents and reminds us of the truth, the reality that we are partakers with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. His body is a substitute for ours, his blood shed, paying the penalty for our sin. And so this morning, as we remember as God's people, we remember and celebrate the joy of being in Jesus Christ. Forever, today, forgiven. Bringing a posture of God's secured favor on our lives every single moment of every single day. Oh, for eternity. Let us remember this together till Jesus comes. Our God and Father in heaven, let your truth and the reality of the, your posture towards your people today is one of no condemnation. Flood our hearts with the joy of that reality. Flood our hearts with the comfort. Flood our hearts and our souls with the relief that we stand before you in your favor. And flood our hearts and our souls with all the motivation that we need to live a life worthy of such a posture. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.